insight into expeditionary operations. I'm going to talk a little bit about dense urban terrain because that's where I worked, LA County, uh, the largest uh, population county by population in the United States with 4,080 square miles, uh, has 88 cities within it, and somewhere between 12 to 14 million people nominally, and during the day that may surge up to above 16. Um, I spent 30 years with the LA County Sheriff's Department in a range of uh, assignments. The bulk of my time I spent uh, doing counterterrorism intelligence. I ran a multi-agency counterterrorism fusion center, the first law enforcement, fire service, public health, civil, military, local, state, federal fusion center in the United States. And later on, got seconded to Department of Homeland Security to help do or help develop 40, 54 um, fusion centers across the country. And right now, uh, being retired, I spend most of my time doing consulting, but I also teach at the Safe Communities Institute at the University of Southern California. Um, kind of a backdrop to the issues. Um, and this is from more of a global perspective than a local perspective, but we're talking about state sovereignty and, gov and governance. How do you actually effectively serve a community and police and protect a community? And some of the challenges are globalization, and that's really because some of our adversaries are linked. Uh, Right-wing extremists, for example, work in Canada, the United States, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and, and on and on and on, and connect on the internet in real time and influence each other's operations. Um, insurgencies occur in a range of ways. Uh, for myself, my bulk of my research, to conclude my doctoral research, was on what I call criminal insurgencies, which is when criminal groups start to erode the solvency of the state or the legitimacy and capacity of the state to respond to, to threats and to serve the public. Mm -hmm. Terrorism is one instantiation of how this works, one that we're no, many the There's a range of conflicts that occur. Uh, the type of conflict that it exists is, can become complex, can become politically nuanced, and we'll talk a bit about that. And all of these can express themselves as crises or if that impact political organizations or operational organizations. Now, traditionally, we look at the issues as inter internally within the state, the law enforcement and police do the mission, and externally, it's done by the military. The types of threats we're dealing with the, the boundaries are permeable. They don't really care. They're, they're globally distributed entities, so therefore the police and military start to look a lot like each other, and crime and war start to, to blend. Um, I think that's anachronistic, and I think we need to realize we're dealing with networked ad adversaries, and the key issue is what is their identity or primary loyalty, and it may, may be to a state, it may be to a non-state group. Now there's a spectrum or spectra, because I think there's multiple spectrum that play um, that we would deal with, civil strife, which is conflict below the level of an armed conflict. That could be riots, it could be disturbances, it could be sporadic terrorism. It could be non-international armed conflict, where the group that we're facing has the sophistication, the organizational capacity to actually exert command and control, and correspondingly, the ability to respect the, the norms of international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict. Um, and it has to be of a level of intensity that it's sustained. Um, this could come to play in international armed conflicts. And within an armed conflict, that does not take away the criminal population, does not take away the existing grievances, and often transnational organized crime groups leverage the conflict to expand their reach and capacity. Um, I broadly call this that phenomena crime wars and criminal insurgencies. Political turmoil is another common thread, insurrection and insurgency of terrorism within and complementing conflict. You may call some of this hybrid warfare. And hybrid warfare is basically, formerly known as gray area phenomena, it's basically where a state or a, or a major state competitor uses non-conventional or irregular means uh, to include crime and leveraging other disinformation, misinformation, and things like that to exert their will. 
the pandemic that we've just gone through, or not even gone through, it's still getting ready, still, still existing and getting ready to surge again, it would appear. It's something that organized crime groups have leveraged, and I would argue that perhaps states can as well. Climate change is going to be a security driver that's gonna create threats into all the future that will any of us listening to myself today will see. And there are converging threats that come together. And I just give you an example of that book, gotta plug my book, you know, so somebody will buy it, but COVID-19 Gangs and Conflict is a collection I edited that looked at how organized crime groups, mafias, uh, Mexican cartels, and gangs in uh, Brazil, in Colombia were able to use COVID and the pandemic as ways to expand their political reach. Um, now we know urban operations, the last couple of days have been there, the next couple of days will be. We've just briefly started up with fighting and built up areas, military operations and urban terrain, urban warfare and urban operations blur. Um, just a couple of the pictures on the slide, you see, you know, We'll see if I can recall them. Hong Kong, Rio de Janeiro, New York City with the Staten Island Ferry. Uh, looks like Los Angeles and uh, Mumbai. Very dense populated areas. Everyone similar but with a lot of common factors come together. So what does civil military integration look like traditionally you know, in, this, in our past and into the future? In the past, we often looked at it as civil defense. And that was to deal with a large scale you know, nuclear type scenario that would impact various cities. Civil defense is not necessarily discussed in the United States any longer, we call it emergency management, but the function of civil defense is a global function. And in fact, civil defense organizations have protection under the Geneva, Geneva Conventions. Police and law enforcement are likely going to be the organizations you'd come in contact with. And I would argue that the police and the military do many things surprisingly similar. Different drivers, different legal authorities, but we're controlling how people move in, in urban space or other space and with, with formed entities. And I think there are special types of police I'll talk about later that may come together. It's not just arms bearers though, you know, and not all cops around the world carry arms regularly. In the UK, they often only have special response squads. In the United States, we always do all the time. And the same with the continental Europe. But to get some of our missions done, we need the fire service, urban search and rescue, hazmat. Um, they are the combined arms of the public safety arena, if you will. You need to add in EMS, hospitals, public health, because whenever there is a large scale conflict, um, public health considerations do come, come together, not in the first few hours, not in the first few days, but over the long term. Um, when I did my training as a medic, they told me that uh, public health considerations may be as detrimental to our operation as trauma, which is what we all often think about in the health side. Public works and transportation, so you can deal with dams, railways, streets, bridges, tunnels. You need to understand all of that. All the dangerous forces that come to play, nuclear, um, hydroelectric power, those are the guys that know how to do that. The transportation people know how to move people in and out through the county. I'll give you an example. I drove here to Los Alamitos from the San Gabriel Valley. I opted not to take the freeway. I opted to take the bus routes because I learned when I was the executive officer for our transit police unit that the bus folks go out there every month and they measure the traffic to see which route is fastest and they align the bus routes to the historically fastest streets. So I took a bus route and got here in a half hour quicker than it would if I took the freeway. You know, so those are little tricks you can understand to negotiate the urban, urban terrain. They're gonna be humanitarian players that come together, the, the ICRC, the uh, National Red Cross Societies, Medicine Sans Frontieres, and, and others that provide services, and civil government. Now, it may at first glance appear that when you come to a combat, large-scale combat operation, that the civil government that's there is no longer relevant. I would argue that's absolutely not true. 
I mean, they're not going to be in the middle of the battle, we hope. In fact, our job would be to try to keep them out of the middle of the battle. But they are the people who are going to help negotiate the provision of services during the entirety of the operation. Um, to give a historical reference, back in the earlier part of my career, in 1992, in the LA riots, uh, the first Marine Expeditionary Force came up from Camp Pendleton to Los Angeles. And I was actually assigned as a liaison during parts of that event to one meth and other parts to the California National Guard. But to get to the salient point, in the first hours of that response, the planners for one meth looked at the LA map. At that time, they called them Thomas Guide maps. They were all paper maps. Uh, now we use you know, GIS and other things. They divided their jurisdictional areas of operations, if you were sub subordinate areas of operations based upon the lines of the freeway, because it looked clean. This freeway goes here, this freeway goes here. The problem is the jurisdictions for the law enforcement agencies, the fire service agencies, the public health agencies, public works, works and civil government don't align to those freeway lines. So rather than having two or three liaison officers uh, for an operation, you may have needed 50. Um, I would argue that if you get to talk to the civil government people, the cops, the emergency managers beforehand, and ask them how the areas are arrayed, you may find a more efficient way to do that. Now, so urban areas, the discussion we've been talking about, range from towns, cities, up to metropolises, mega cities, or popular, you know, it's over 10 million, or, or megapolises, uh, even bigger than a mega city. It could be a mega city cluster. Like uh, here, the Great Bay region of China, we have multiple megacities concentrated together. That's a scenario that could be, at first glance, very hard to deal with, because you deal with places like Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Shenzhen, uh, Guangzhou, large, large cities. But you don't need to do them all at the same time. It's like the elephant, one bite at a time, prioritizing, understanding where the centers of gravity and decisive points may be at different points in time so you conduct your operation. Uh, so it really takes detailed planning and understanding. Um, one of the things in Los Angeles that becomes important if you were to come do a civil support mission here would be the urban wildland interface. That's basically where the built up areas converge with the natural, natural environment. In Southern California, every few years, the fires burn from the mountains to the sea. They've been doing it forever, they will do forever. I've been to like five different Malibu fires. Uh, one of the most notable events I was at prior to retiring was the station fire. I was the sheriff's main um, tactical planning representative emergency manager for that event. And, uh, we went for three months across, basically from the San Gabriel Valley out to the San Fernando Valley, uh, covering a large area, doing lots of evacuation. Uh, yesterday there was discussion in the class how many people are gonna leave when there's large scale conflict. Well, I'll tell you, there were walls of fire five stories tall, and deputy sheriffs would walk up to people's houses and they'd be out there with a hose with no water pressure protecting their house and tell them it's time to go, and they're like, we're not going. So I don't know if it's 10% are gonna leave, but it's gonna vary. It's gonna vary at the time of the operation, and you're gonna have to figure out how to plan around them, because yeah, it'd be nice to evacuate them and take them out, but then you would not be able to evacuate all the other people who needed to be evacuated. So you need to consider that. Um, some of the things when that burns for us, and it may or may not be relevant, but it may have some parallel, is a lot of marijuana burns or uh, drug grows or clandestine labs occur in that interface. So when that stuff burns and you breathe it, it's a really bad thing. So think of burn pits and things that we faced in places like Iraq, you know, similar. The urban littoral interface, I think the combat in the future, conflict in the future, is going to be urban, mostly because the world is becoming increasingly urban. But where do people live? The urban areas are often along the, the seacoast. So how you deal with that urban littoral interface becomes important. So you start to have to think about riverine operations, uh, amphibious operations, and not all amphibious operations are big, large operations across the beach. They may be smaller insertions, but you need to configure that into your thought, into your thought. 
And some of the ways cops and firefighters do that in urban areas may become nice lessons. Um, the issues in the battle space is the operational space we've talked about, and I'm just gonna reinforce them. It is density. Density makes things complicated. It could be sprawl, you know, because, LA, for example, the metropolitan region basically runs from like Oxnard up in you know Ventura County to San Diego with a little fingerprint in between being Camp Pendleton that gives a little relief. If Camp Pendleton wasn't there, it'd be like the East Coast where your city basically runs from Boston to Washington, D.C. or any longer, maybe even down into North Carolina. Sprawl's complicated because it just increases the number of, you know, factors, complicating factors, the number of political jurisdictions, the amount of people, um, the lines of communication that you have to control become more difficult. There's all, always multiple dimensions. I would call it five-dimensional space. Um, it's the height or the depth, and cities are often vertical. And I'll tell you, the, the ladder truck on the hooking ladder for the fire truck Rarely can they go up more than 10 to 13 stories. So if you're going beyond that, and to 13, that's the top. I've, I've climbed on those things, and once it gets beyond two stories, I, I'm thinking I want to do something else. Um, but you got to think, that's hard. Um, you come in by helicopter to the roof. That, that may work or it may not. How much can you actually bring in by a helicopter, come down to the roof, especially when things are burning and the weather p patterns change, because fires change the weather in all cases. Um, the conflagration fire creates its own weather things if it's a big enough fire, like a wildland fire. In the urban areas, the urban canyons catalyze the effects of the fire in ways that are hard to predict. Um, width, how, you know, obviously that's one dimension we think of. Length, um, time. Time would be the, another dimension to think of, the fourth dimension. And then finally, cyber. Now, cyberspace and human space had traditionally been viewed as separate endeavors. I think we're living in a period of time now where the two are converging, and you can't take cyber out of human space. Um, a couple of years ago, we were talking about doing urban operations exercises, and the discussion was, let's take cyber out of it because the city is too complicated already. And I'm like, but the city is embedded with cyber. Smart cities, sensors, cameras, everything. You learn as a cop real quickly that everything is wired. There are cameras on everybody. Now people carry cameras. And anything you do, they are going to film. And if it's commendable, they probably aren't going to send it. If it's questionable, I guarantee it will get to the watch commander of that unit. I had a beating on the LA subway, and I was receiving emails and the scores, I mean, dozens of emails from around the world. They're like, have you seen this? I'm like, yeah, 15,000 times, but okay. And you still have to go through each one. Everything is, is gonna be tied. Identity intelligence is a thing like the NSA and the guys at you know, Fort Meade would talk about. Everything has a signature. Every sensor has a signature. We all carry our cell phones with us. We have a signature. Every time you look at on a satellite, they can start to determine from a movement who you may be, then it's very hard to obscure it. Underground, subways, tunnels, and utilities. Big cities, you think of London, New York, Berlin, Moscow, you know, have, have subways. They have commuter rail lines that run in addition to the urban subway. There are tunnels. They're often abandoned tunnels. There was once the red cars in LA and they had tunnels that went under the city. Well, when they closed the red cars down, they didn't close the tunnels down. They're still there. And we don't normally see them, but homeless people find them, criminals find them. Uh, and sometimes cops and firefighters need to get down there and operate. And I suspect if we were doing an urban fight, some of our adversaries may understand. I know that drug cartels in Guanajuato, uh, Mexico, have exploited the tunnels to escape from Mexican government forces um, and to, you know, and to maneuver. Um, now think of it, if you maneuver in a subway in a modern city, the sensors may become, everything goes two ways. It's not, not always a, a liability a liability to you could be a strength to your adversary, a strength to you could be a liability to your adversary, and that can shift. 
somebody gets onto a subway and there are sensors, now you may under, be able to understand that they're moving. But just know they're there. Utility is complicated. Rail, rail tunnels for urban railways, they often have third, third rails or overhead catenary wire. It's generally a bad idea not to touch those. Um, and you may or may not want to turn them off because you don't know what the outcome of turning it off is unless you talk to that transportation guy because you could cause second and third order effects that you don't anticipate. The surface area, I mean, the military has always been an expert on, on surface terrain. Uh, in the urban area, you have freeways, hills, valleys, rivers, harbors, offshore islands, offshore platforms. Ports, mountains, housing projects, factories, et cetera. Vertical and high res we talked about, they're, they're really complicated. Some facilities, some objectives may have all of those together, maybe an interface. They have a subterranean space, they have a surface space, they have a vertical high rise space, and you may figure out there are different ways to move in. Train, terrain considerations that are ever present. Lines of communication. If I was talking about Mexican drug cartels, I might consider what they call plazas, or the key drug trafficking areas that a drug cartel controls to move their product. And if I was thinking of like the cartel Jalisco Nueva, Nueva Generacion, or the Tijuana cartel, we might think that Tijuana is a, is a plaza they control, but the Tijuana plaza in reality is cross-border. It's the Tijuana San Diego Plaza, which is directly connected to Los Angeles. And you know, if you go into like the Juarez El Paso Plaza, that's directly connected to, I don't know, like Chicago. So you need to start thinking of those spaces and flows that uh, Colonel Higgins was talking about the other day. I was gonna say Detective Higgins because I know him in that world too. But you need to see that these things aren't always apparent at first glance. Um, I look at border zones. Now the border zone between the United States and Mexico, uh, for example, a third of the commerce of both nations is in that border zone. If you disrupt that, you break things on both sides and we may not know what those are. I don't think that's unique to the United States. I just got back from Berlin on the, the day this course started and I got a chance to go over and see Checkpoint Charlie, which is like really cool for an old guy. Remember that from you know, all the movies and all the stuff they told in, in school. And you see the border right there. And you see how that borderline came in and disrupted that city. Somehow people got across. Borders are still there. Um, border zones are vibrant. Organized crime probably knows how to move product across any border on the planet better than the cops that try to interdict them. So sometimes you may need to work to look at that for your intel. We talked about spaces and flows. Markets exploit spaces and flows. And if you're talking about things like moving chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear materials, or you know, fissile materials, uh, drugs, fentanyl, humans in arms, um, markets become important. A rhetorical question I often ask folks, and it first came to mind during the Iraq war, is we were finding the beginning of the Iraq war that uh, stolen cars from Los Angeles were winding up in Iraq. And the question I asked my Intel analysts at that time is, well, how did they do that? And there's a long convoluted answer. They didn't drive, I don't think. You know, but. That shows you that markets become important to understand. There are some places where government does government does not control. That doesn't make them ungoverned. There are other governed areas. There may be zones of impunity, is what some people have called that. I call them criminal enclaves. Uh, impunity is interesting. If you tell some states that have a high level of organized crime activity to the point where there are raging criminal insurgencies and crime wars that I think in some cases you could argue have reached the threshold of being a non-international armed conflict, the government will say, nah, we control everything everywhere. But you know, there are entire states of Mexico, Tamaulipas comes to mind, there are entire places like Guanajuato, uh, that come to mind, parts of Sinaloa come to mind, where the cartels have more control. There are places in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, where the PCC, the first capital command, exercises more territorial control than the state, and, and to some of the residents has more legitimacy. In Mexico, and not, not to jam Mexico, it's a wonderful place, I enjoy going there and work with the folks down there all the time. The level of impunity, May, they nominally say it's like 95% because I think that keeps the ambassador happy. Um, it may reach 99.5%, which means somewhere between 5% and a half percent 
of people who are, co are convicted for the actual felony crimes they commit, which means that getting away with murder is not just a theoretical possibility. Those are areas that dealing with the state becomes complicated, and sometimes you may have to negotiate with non-state actors to achieve uh, some of your objectives. The urban is connected to other things. You have urban, exurban, you know, the area that's kind of, you know, peri-urban is in between there too. Uh, you know, the area right at the thing. Exurban you could call rural, and the littoral space I think is really important uh, to, to f understand. Lifelines and deadly forces we talked about before, um, threw up the international symbol there, just to kind of reinforce that. In the Ukraine, the Russian military decided it was a good idea to conduct military operations and direct fires into uh, like Chernobyl, a uh, nuclear plant there. Um, arguably that's a violation of international law unless there's a really compelling military objective and I'm not sure what that would be. Uh, I'm not sure why you would want to put troops into a contaminated area, um, but I guess they think differently than we do. Um, but you need to know where those things are. And they're not always visible. We know the big nuclear uh, generating stations. We generally know where, you know, where they do storage or where the natural laboratories and things are. But there are often research reactors inside the city in universities that are small that you don't know are there. And they're not going to cause this large scale operation of the meltdown of Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. But if you like uh, detonate one or detonate things near it and you spread that material and you're walking through it afterwards, you're probably not going to do that too much. So you want to know where those are. Dams are other things that you really need to know and understand how that works uh, for similar reasons. The civil infrastructure you need to know, I mean, know where the police stations is important because the police can either be civil defense operators or they can, if they become arms bearers, become combatants. And you need to distinguish between the two because they're, if they're not combatants against you, you've got to protect them. If, if they are combatants against you, that changes it. Um, Police stations are often a place where communities go to get resources, so they become important. Same with fire stations. Fire stations have capabilities that may become good for you to know, good for you to use, or they you know, can help the community. Hospitals are important. Obviously, we don't target hospitals unless, again, there's a compelling need and, or somebody is using the hospital and taking it out of the protective capability. Uh, but we, we know that. The Russians apparently from time to time forget that. Uh, but So we need to consider that. The one that most people don't think about, and it gets hard, is prisons. What do you do when somebody attacks a prison or uses a, a prison or if the prison's in the way or if those prisoners get loose, what are they going to do? Um, it's very hard. Some of them need to be secured. Some of them, you know, aren't really friendly. Um, when I worked in the LA County Jail, everyone said, what are you going to do in a prison when there's an earthquake? The inmates are going to riot and kill you. And I'll tell you, the reality is they're scared. Uh, I guess the technical term is shitless. And they look for you to tell them what to do because they've never done that before. And that may be the same with these guys, or it may not. So just a planning consideration and make sure you find a liaison in the correctional service because they tend to know what to do and how to do it. Climate is vitally important. I know the old guy once upon a time told me Intel is like weather enemy and terrain. And that's an old formulation that's been, been moved up. But climate in Los Angeles County, LA County, for example, has about 10 microclimates. You have the basin that's influenced by the sea. You have the valleys where it gets much hotter. You have mountains, and, and those varies. When you do wildland fire, which you know, in the guard role, some of you guys probably have already done, that influences how you do it. But it influences things like the disposition of you know, chemical and biological weapons, which you know are prescribed, but that doesn't mean your adversary is not going to use them. We just see reported in the Washington Post this morning that ISIS was looking at using uh, chemical weapons in Europe in 2015, and you know, so I mean, <laughs> they're still there. Um, Obviously, there have been issues with Russians and their proxies using chemical weapons in Syria. So that's obviously part of their TTP. So microclimates become important. The one micro weather influence that's vitally important right now is heat. Urban areas are hotter than non-rural areas, exurban areas. You often get heat 
considerations. So if you're moving troops in a densely populated urban area carrying a lot of heat, a lot of equipment in the heat, you gotta hydrate them. And there may be you know, casualties that come there, heat stroke, et cetera, heat stress and things like that. The people in a large metropolitan area are often diverse and even countries that are largely homogenous uh, speak multiple languages. I think in LA County, they talk about in the LA Unified School District, there's 157 languages spoken. That, that creates a, a big job for the civil affairs guys and the people who do translation, right? Um, there are people who have special needs. So you can move people on wheelchairs, evacuate people from hospitals. Um, that, there's no one right answer, but you have to factor that. And they're obviously cultural property. Um, that you really have to avoid attacking or conducting operations, offensive operations in uh, houses of worship come to mind, unless again, there's a compelling military objective. So what is urban terrain? It's the physical, it, that's tough. As tough as the physical as it is, it's easy to envision because you can walk through and see tall building, river, bridge, subway station. Where it gets really complex is the governance. There's a jurisdictional complexity of how you do it. Now I'll talk about LA County because I was the law enforcement mutual aid action officer for LA County for about 10 years or so. LA County, just as an example, 88 cities. You all think of the city of LA, he's the big mayors on TV. The other 87 demand the same respect. And I found the hard way, if you don't give it to them, they took call your boss pretty quick. Um, there are special districts. There's probably about 154 special districts. Vector control, transportation districts, school districts, as we know, school districts sometimes have their own police. Students, school students could be at, at risk, things like that. Um, there are ports, so you have you know, port authority and port police. Um, who bring capability and can get there. There are transit agencies, often they have police too sanitation, et cetera. Those are part of that jurisdictional thing. Um, and of course you have law enforcement. In LA County, there's like 43 independent police departments. The Sheriff's Department lays over the county area, provides some of those. That's not counting the highway patrol at the, st at the state level and fishing game people at the state level and you know forest rangers for the national parks and all the federal agencies that play. So there are dozens of law enforcement agencies. About 43 or so fire agencies. Now both of those have well-defined law enforcement and fire service mutual aid organizations that the California Guard routinely works with. So that's fairly easy and that's replicated in most states. But when you go well, you know, to an expeditionary movement, how many do you have of those? Who, who are they? What can they do? Public health, you're gonna need them if there's gonna be an epidemic down the line. EMS and medical folks, we have to ensure we provide medical capacity to the people who live in the area, especially if we, if we occupy it, that's actually a legal obligation. Um, there's probably an ethical and moral obligation. But the real reason you do it is because it confers legitimacy to our endeavor, which is why drug cartels, the, the cartel who's going to never know a generation a couple days ago put out an edict telling all their subordinate gangs don't attack hospitals, doctors, and priests. They're doing it because they care about hospitals, doctors, and priests? No, they do it because they need the legitimacy and they know that erodes it. And that works for us too. And we're the good guys, right? Uh, hopefully. Public works, I don't even know how many of those there are. We, we go to the one, they have their own mutual aid thing here. You go to the one big agency and then they'll break it out. But you need to know that. Emergency management, they do, um, Every city has an emergency management organization. Every county has one, the state has them. The one that's difficult, or I don't want to say problematic, but the one that we're all going to be influenced by are elected officials. Elected officials, like everything else, they're neither good nor bad. They confer advantage. They can confer legitimacy to your operation. They can expedite resources and access and tell you who does what, or they can be impediments, barriers, because they may have a competing objective. In the Ukraine, I'll be, oh, I can't, Ukraine, I'm dating myself, in Ukraine, there are many elected officials in some of the areas that Russia is seeking to influence that owe loyalty to the Russians and not the Ukrainian government. So that's something you need to know, um, probably 
one of those priority intelligence information requirements that you might want to push out somewhere. There's always going to be humanitarian, non-governmental organizations and private voluntary organizations working there, and every one of them has their own character, their own understanding, their own preference, their own bias about what the military does. I know a lot of them don't like the police. So, you know, that's probably similar. The ICRC, the people that come on the ground there, many of their field reps are actually former military folks, so they tend to understand, but they have their own set of rules. So we just need to know that they're gonna be there and part of the equation. So how do you do that? In the US, we call dealing with coming into CONUS, defense support to civil authorities. In California, the cities are part, if LA County, the 88 cities plus the unincorporated area, you put them together with the special districts and that becomes the operational area. And that's right in here. LA County is right here, and then Orange County is right there. LA and Orange County together become uh, mutual aid region, state region um, 1A. Um, it was once one covered the entire thing. Actually, it's right here, LA and Orange. 1A is up north. We got kicked, LA Sheriff got kicked out of uh, 1A uh, for going to a demonstration. And I don't think they liked the way we used force at the demonstration, so they split the mutual aid. That's decades ago. The first time we went up north to deal with a fire um, it was about 20 years later. And I think all the people that thought we were bad influence had retired. Um, LA right here to combined, that's probably 16 million people. Um, it's probably the most densely populated county in the area. Um, the San Bernardino County is like much bigger, but with a lot less people. Uh, but go through the operational area. So basically the operational area to state. And basically how that goes is the region, region one, it'll go to the sheriff for law enforcement mutual aid in LA County. And he'll say, okay, I, I've exceeded it. I need state aid. He'll go to the OES law enforcement representative, the deputy chief for OES law enforcement. And he'll say, hey, we're gonna need more. If you're the sheriff of Orange County, that's the coordinator for Orange County. That should, Orange County goes to the sheriff of LA County because they're in the region and that's the regional rep. And then it moves up. Unless in the 92 riots, you're the mayor of the city of Los Angeles and you decide the cat call in the county is not such a good idea, you're just going to call the governor and the governor is just going to call straight to the president and you're going to move everything and forget the fact that we had a system in place since 1957 or something. And then we don't have a warning order and then logistics gets all messed up. But I point that out not to be critical, I point it out to say things don't always go to plan which means that you have to have contingencies, you have to know. Obviously, there are ways around it. The state military goes through the military department, which is the California National Guard plus the uh, California uh, military themselves. And from there, it can go to regional compacts or from state to federal. In many cases in the United States, it's better to stay under state authority because the range of missions the Guard can conduct are greater um, than they are when you go to the federal side, which becomes more restrictive. Um, at the operational, at the, at the level that we, uh, we live in, that's gonna be determined by other factors that we're just gonna need to adjust, but the planners need to lay out what those missions may look like. And what some of those missions are gonna be and this goes in the United States and out. Public order and riots. It's not unknown for foreign entities in a hybrid threat, hybrid warfare context to leverage civil disorder and riots to destabilize a nation. Uh, it's happening in Colombia right now, uh, and it's happened in other places. Riots will, can be laid upon. Now, riots and crowd control are different than combat operations, but they may be occurring at the same time. Natural disasters are another range of mission. And the, only a question, if you're at war, does that stop there from being earthquakes, fires, floods, and tornadoes? Maybe yes, I don't think it stops it, but they could occur at the same time. You have mass fatality events. Um, that brings a similar consideration on how you deal with um, bodies, you know, decedents, mortuary capabilities, and mass atrocity investigation. If you go to a place like Mexico, where they have such a large number of mass graves, they don't have the capacity organically within the Mexican public safety system to actually process the number of uh, mass graves they have. 
You could have CBR and hazmat missions going to be layered on top. And it's not just going to be military grade weapons. It's not just going to be, uh, you know, sarin, GB, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It could be toxic industrial chemicals, and that requires a different set of personal protective gear than you're going to have in your typical mop suit. So I see the civil support guys were outside before I came in today, the 9th CST. Well, that type of capability, or the sea birth, or others comes to mind. Terrorism can occur during a conflict. It occur outside of a conflict. It could leverage everything that we have. In the U.S., there may be national special security events that you come to, and we make an artificial distinction between homeland security and homeland defense, and distinctions based upon the organizational legal authorities of folks that come together. If you just look, I like this picture here. I thought, LA County Sheriff Sergeant used to work for me together with a CAL FIRE officer. They're operating in the same terrain. That's our kind of joint forces, the same types of capabilities come to bear here. And the bottom picture there is just the Tokyo Sarin attack in 1995 where the Onshin Rinko, a non-state group, decided they were going to be tried in a in a court case the next day, decided to conduct a sarin attack at the subway station underneath the police station because they thought that would stop the prosecution. It actually didn't. Uh, I think they just executed the final member or, you know, lawfully executed the final member of that organization for that crime just a couple months ago. More missions, and these come together for everybody else. Uh, and if I didn't know better, I think that's Los, Los Alamitos in the, in the picture. Um, okay, so there's global and CONUS missions. Security and force protection comes together. There's intra-conflict policing is something that I think lots of militaries don't have the organic capacity to deal with. There's often the belief that when you're in large scale combat operations that you can't do policing, you can't do atrocity investigation. I'm not sure that's actually true. It's more complicated. It, there are some things you may not be able to do, but they're doing right now real-time investigation of mass atrocities in Ukraine, and they're actually police out there on the front lines controlling and moving people. But it's more than what MPs do. It's something in the Balkan conflicts for intra-conflict. Um, they saw the need to bring in the, the Italian Carabinieri and the French Gendarmerie because they're military-formed organizations that have the capacity to provide some combat missions, mostly in the light infantry capacity, uh, but also policing missions, investigation, understand how to mobilize the cops. In fact, the NATO, NATO cent Center of Excellence in Italy is really building up what they call stability police forces to be able to do that type of mission. The European Gendarmerie Force is a composite of European forces to go outside of the Euro European Union to do that. The second type of policing mission that comes together here is post-conflict policing, and that's when you shift from military operations back to civil governance, and it, often places where are embroiled in conflict, their police become arms bearers, become moved into a military function, and then they have to go back. Um, so there's a need to you know, provide that, those functions throughout the whole spectrum of conflict. Uh, mass atrocities, humanitarian relief come together, peacekeeping. Not large-scale combat operations, but certainly something. Large-scale combat operations aren't going to take away peacekeeping. They're not going to take away lesser-included operations. If you look at the Cold War, um, Cold War was riddled with proxy wars, was riddled with revolutions, um, non-combatant evacuation operations, insurgencies used to further the goals of our adversaries. All those things are going to continue. And I would argue that urban peacekeeping is more complicated, for the same reasons urban conflict is, than rural or ex-urban peacekeeping. Um, and those are things that need to be looked at. You met, I talked about evacuation that would be there. Certainly there's going to be EOD or, you know, bomb, bomb techs and CBR and survey missions come together. And, you know, I mean, they're still finding unexploded ordnance in, in Germany and uh, in France, you know, 70 years later from World War II. So there are obviously things that need to be there. There's going to be special operations, counterterrorism and coin operations that go on here. Medical and decon are going to come. For me, the, 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 the one that 
pulls it all together and it integrates this, it's probably because I am an Intel guy, with intelligence in ISR support. How do you get the information, the knowledge, the understanding, the context to the commanders and the subordinate leaders that run all of these different operations and harmonize or synchronize them into one theater of operations? And how do you do that? Mission, enemy terrain, weather, troops, support time, available civilian considerations. Civilian considerations are huge. Um, for all the reasons we just spoke about, they may, they influence all the others, perhaps, what that relative may, weight may be at a given point in time is gonna re rely upon military necessity. Um, you're gonna have to look at things like, you know, distinction and proportionality and protection, and all those IHL or law of armed conflict issues that come together, but that's the baseline. Then you're going to want to consider things like time, the forces you have, the space they're operating in, and then that moves it back to you, whether enemy and terrain. You got to do mission analysis. Now, there was once an urban generic intelligence requirements handbook that the Marine Corps developed that has a lot of the issues identified that I just talked about in a more granular fashion. It's been declassified, so it was never classified. I think it was for official use only, but it's been totally declassified. You can find it on, online. The, well, I guess it's the, uh, oh, one of the oversight organizations, the Federation of uh, Scientists or something, uh, has put that out there. It's a good resource to look at. I think this really, all of this demands intelligence preparations. Whether you call it IPB, whether you call it urban IPB, as Russ Glenn and Jamie Medby who did in their evolution a while, a while back, or you call it intelligence preparation of the operational environment, which is what the guys at NGA like to call it. I call it in the civil environment, intelligence preparation for operations. And one of the reasons is, as I explained to one of the elected officials in Los Angeles County, a member of the Board of Supervisors, that we're gonna do intelligence preparation in the battlefield for LA County, and I, I think I lit the woman's hair on fire. Um, and she spun off the wall and I said, okay, we're gonna do intelligence preparation for operations. But we're not gonna, you know, if you wanna get really good at it, it's like doing, if you're in the police or fire service doing the incident command system. You can't just go do that incident command system or set up your Napoleonic staff model for the big stuff. You gotta use it every day so the people doing it actually know who speaks to whom, what, who does what, when, why. So. I would argue that something like IPO needs to be embedded into your day-to-day -day operation and then enhanced when you go off to do an expeditionary operation or disaster. This all is gonna require civil military coordination and often that's done in a civil military operation center, a CMOC. Those are really good. But I would add the humanitarian to that to emphasize that. Um, and then you're gonna need lots of liaison. Liaison officers, um, some cases is gonna be tactical liaison teams. Because as we were talking yesterday about doing that intelligence preparation, the two shop may not have enough knowledge to do all of this and understand all of this. You may need engineers. Um, when we would go do liaison, uh, I configure my guys in LA County, I grab bomb techs, I grab uh, hazmat techs, I grab detectives and put them together with my operations planners and intelligence officers and sent them out as a team to do liaison. If I was doing some of this, I may grip firefighters, because sometimes, like aviation firefighters, you know, from a base, those guys know how to do, how to talk to firefighters, first of all. And one of the things, I did the security uh, planning preparation for the G8 meeting in Denver back in the late 90s. And I brought, brought a team of cops out. But I brought along a fire guy too. Now as a cop, I was looking at tactical things, which is probably a lot like what the mil military operators look at. I was looking at high ground, looking at line of sight, where do I make an ambush from? And my battalion chief looks at me and says, hey John, I'm like, yeah, what's up? He's like, where are the fire hydrants? I'm like, what? And because like, that's the first thing they look for because they need the water, right? So if you're gonna do a multi-agency operation or you're gonna do mass casualty decon or something like that, you need to have water. So having a diverse liaison team may become important. It may give them flexibility. It may allow them to talk to all the different operators you need. So what are kind of the bottom line lessons that, that may start to come together? Terrain knowledge is essential and it prefers advantage. Now, if there were people, if we weren't virtual, I'd ask you, 
who has the advantage of terrain knowledge? And the, the quick, easy answer is it's obviously the, the defender. The defender tends to know the terrain better than the expeditionary force that's inserting themselves. Um, IPB or IPO or whatever you want to call the intelligence preparation helps you gain that knowledge for the advantage. You have to know the population. It's obviously your adversaries, and they're, depending upon where you're going, there may be multiple. It's going to include gangs, militias, the, your own allies, because they operate differently, so you need to know how they, they work. That's your friendly force, you know, intelligence requirements. How do, what do they do? Neutrals that are going to be out there, and the forces you, that are going to support. You need to understand all of that to put together your package. Got to remember distinction, protections, and proportionality when you apply force into a populated area. That's going to tell me that civil affairs becomes important from the military perspective. When you look at the police, you might want to look at how the police do community policing, how we go into a community and understand how the community functions, operates, who to talk to. It's basically knowing, protecting, and supporting the community it gives you legitimacy. And that exists not only domestically, day to day, it exists when you go expeditionary. And as I mentioned earlier, the gangs and cartels already know that, and they leverage that for themselves. Swarming and counter-swarming are other ways that are other tools or things that come to play. Swarming is basically taking disparate units, pulling them together to converge and conduct an attack. And that, terrorists do that. Uh, the Mumbai um, attack, uh, where they attack the multiple uh, hotels, and the transit terminal was a swarming attack. The Paris attacks, the two Paris attacks in 2015 were swarming attacks where they converged. You need to start to figure out how to counter swarm. And that's something distributing your capability and insurging it. Make them for advantage in an area where ISR is persistent, or I would even say ubiquitous with the current sense of things. And it really requires ops intel fusion. It's, you can't just, as the intelligence guy, do this without knowing how the operation is going to be impacted, affected, uh, implemented, and then discussed back and forth. And then obviously, it's a embedded in the ops intel fusion is an understanding of how logistics is going to operate and an understanding of what future operations are going to look like. Because we all think of the current, but the current changes as you, you move along. This is the version of IPB that we adopted in LA County, Intelligence Preparation for Operations. Now it has all the four steps that are doctrinal in the US military world, except one, we made it a canister because we're dealing with multiple threats at one time, and we're not just doing one operation, there may be multiple simultaneous operations. We all, going back to the OODA loop, uh, Colonel John Boyd's vision of um, observe, orient, decide, act, and that's the simple version. The core of orientation was analysis and synthesis to gain situational understanding. Um, so I put that in the middle saying that's kind of what energizes the IPB four steps, because it's continuous. You can't just do it and leave it. You gotta always do that. And the other thing in there, a little bullseye in there is collection management. Well, you gotta figure out how to get the information here that you need. So step one, define the ops space. Cool, named areas of interest, critical infrastructure, local to global. We were talking about NAIs yesterday, made, made my heart go, you know, made me happy to see that. Step two, describe the ops space effects. Well, cool. Target folders, response information folders, we call them in the civil world. You know, population, terrain, weather, context, cultural features, geospatial intel, cyber intelligence, or how to deeply get into information and know the organizational dynamics of all the entities they're playing. Call that geosocial. Then you start to move in. Step three, evaluate the op four or potential threat elements and their threats. If I was trying to anticipate a threat before it came, this little bit here, the indication and warning envelope, that's about when you can start sensing your adversary. I'd like to push it back earlier with cyber it. Um, or you know, here's kind of like deep indications of warning. I'd like to push that back because then I have more time to plan and adapt to where they're going. Um, at all points, in all stages, you're gonna be 
whoever is running your ops can be putting out requests for information to gather this, right? And you can, right now, in the old days, you have to do it serial, one, two, three, four, the way, and echelon to echelon. The way things go now with our information technology capabilities, real-time messaging, you could be working on this parallel with the echelons upstream and talking back and forth. So you could probably do this quicker. You could probably be reaching out to other entities that are gonna come maneuver with you and talk about the things that you can talk about to get gain a better understanding. But at that level, you're still looking at adaptive red teaming. Is my, you know, what, what, it, what might we be facing? We may, may pre-do playbooks, so when you move into an area to conduct an operation, some of this has been pre-templated. You obviously can't just run it without refreshing it, but you might want to look at you know, threats, influences, epidemiological intelligence, getting back to that disease size, and I already talked about deep intel. Uh, before I go to the, to the end, Basically, scan, monitor, and forecast. You're gonna do through, through, through sensors. Now, sensors are people, they're technology, uh, they're whatever you can get that's gonna tell you where there is something, a cell phone, CCTV, um, overhead imagery, all of that. You're gonna scan the horizon, monitor specific threats. So if you think we're gonna get ready to go expeditionary to, I don't know, say Taiwan, maybe we'd start monitoring things happening in the South China Sea. And then we're gonna to start to forecast what the operation may look like so we can build this out to the depth we need. You're gonna move from indications of warning to an operational net assessment, which basically means at this point in time, between our tactical situation and the strategic, this is what we're gonna face. I already talked about the OODA loop at the bottom. All of this needs to be done in current and future ops, and in all cases, you need to look at centers of gravity and decisive points or decisive influences, depending on what your doctrine says. Those play at all steps. At all steps, you have deception, which means you need counter deception. At all steps, there could be swarming or counter swarming. You need to always limit groupthink and uh, you know all the intelligence decision analysis dynamics that come together. Uh, mirror imaging is one that comes together. Um, and that you, you can't, can't really avoid that. Um, when you get to the step four, and this is where I diverge from doctrine, and I'm sorry, I'm academic nowadays, and I'm not bound by doctrine, but uh, you look at determining the opposing forces or enemy, we call it opposing force in the police service because it's not nice to call the citizens you serve the enemy. Um, although I have deputies that would routinely do that and I tell them not to. Um, but you, I would also want to look at what our friendly course of action may be. And the reason we do that in the civil side is because we don't have the deep knowledge, the expeditionary experience, the planning tail, logistical tail, support tail that the military does. So I may need to go to one of those, if I went to LAPD and told them I had something, they're big, they have about 10,000 cops, that unit you know, was about the same size as mine. If I went to one of those small police departments with 10 cops, a chief and 10 cops, right? And, I mean, they're not gonna be able to do this. So you're gonna have to tell them, but they may, they may be legally in charge. So you may need to tell them this is what you do. And I don't wanna predispose what a coalition operation looks like, but you may be supporting, working with, uh, deploying with a, an organization that's not as sophisticated as the US military or a NATO force, right? So you may, that's something to think about. Um, obviously at all those points, you can all get resource status and situation status. Um, and one of the ways we would push it out, so it becomes not just a planning document, it would put, try to push it out as actionable intel in what I would call a mission folder, which would be the grist you would give to an incident commander so they could build their actual operations plan or operations order, you know, and that's not, the terminology may be different. That's not really different than the NATO staff planning process. It's just simplified here. All of this has to be part of an ongoing intelligence thing. It never stops. Intel never stops. Start with trends and potentials. What's happening? What it might look like. Then you start asking what's the capability and intention of your adversary. And then you do your operational net assessment. You can do most of what you need to do in the open without classified information. Um, not everybody will believe that. I've supported people who thought that classified information conferred legitimacy and made the knowledge good. It just doesn't do that. To get to the bathroom without an escort, but it doesn't do that. Um, you need to do all source, all phase fusion. Fusion in the domestic space, they tend to think is up here in the warning, we're gonna fuse it, the threat information put it out. You have to fuse at all those steps. Otherwise, it's not gonna actually work. Um, so what, what does the future look like? 
Well, crime wars in the Western Hemisphere and beyond, from where I come from, are there. Where you're looking at is large-scale you know, combat operations. I'd say the two aren't mutually exclusive. The two are likely to come together. History, historically, they had. Um, whether they will in the future or not, I mean, I think the Peninsula Campaign that Napoleon fought uh, places like, you know, Spain. You had the large-scale combat operation embedded upon irregular conflict, so this isn't new to our, our era. Um, we may, may need new legal political frameworks or regimes on the law side. IHL, how does it apply for NIACs? Could it definitely need global cooperation? That, by the way, is a Mexican uh, national police vehicle. Doesn't look like a radio car driving down the street here. Um, they're basically, their police have now become light infantry. I mean, um, you need to look at the force structure. And that's something that Intel may start to understand what the force structure you're facing is, and then maybe start to consider how we'll do it. Every operation is going to require intelligence support. Now, the military knows that. I support civil guys. They don't even necessarily know what that is. And those are the guys that you're going to be working with. So you got to figure out how to translate. Real quick, case study. When I look at cartels, so just because that's one of my hobbies. This, by the way, is a cartel who is going to Nueva Generacion, artisanal armored vehicle. And they're flying. I can't tell what weapons on there. I think they were 30 cals, but they're flying their own drone. That's one of those uh, Mavic DJI drones, and they're doing combined operations. They're actually figuring out how to weaponize those and drop um, explosive small you know, munitions off those. Let's hope they don't figure out how to weaponize uh, CBRN stuff. Uh, the radiological stuff on that side wouldn't probably be more than an irritant, but it would scare the hell out of everybody. They do drive-by shootings, car bombs, grenades, armed assaults, kidnapping. They use tunnels so subterranean comes together. They love blockades to channelize the response. Um, they do dismemberment of their people. They assassinate. They behead. They capture Mexican military folks, torture them online. They, do, or they wear GoPro cameras and film it and then put it out. When they attack cops in Tijuana, um, the cartels down there have the police radio system and they broadcast their torture online for all the cops and tell them they're come, coming to their family and sometimes they'll read the address of the cop's house. That changes your view of things a little bit. The mass graves, they do social cleansing with internally, uh, you know, IDPs, internally displaced persons and refugees. They do information operations. Um, so from something simple like a narco mounted, they put up a, a plaque saying what they want to corpse messaging. They'll capture one of us and then they'll write their message on the body with a knife and then film it and send it home. I've seen them chop people's heads off and uh, stitch them onto soccer balls and kick them around on film. It's really sick stuff. Um, they use intelligence. They use how cones or lookouts. Um, they have their own surveillance. In Culiacan, where the Sedena and the Guardia Nacional went to capture a couple of uh, um, El Chapo Guzman's sons, the Sinaloa cartel had pole cameras and CCT cameras arrayed throughout the entire state. The, um, the Zetas actually had a wired microwave relay, relay network going from Tamaulipas up north all the way down to Veracruz so they could move messaging back and forth, their own radio and cyber capability. They do attack cops, police journalists, and things like that. And obviously that could be layered on top of a large scale operation. From where I come from, it's the blurring of crime and war. And this is just an example in Brazil where you have military capability, and civil military, to include their, their, their military police, are actually state and national guard, more or less. Um, and they work together. The hybrid that they came up with was they call urban pacification units, and they were able to bring kind of gendarmerie capability to the fight or to the situation. Which is better, police or the military? It depends on what you want to do. You, you need both. They need to be at the right time and place for the right mission. You need to hold, all of this is whole government. Once you get past the kinetic phase, it's all whole government. Police, courts, corrections, social services. You need to bring in the local, municipal, state, and federal. You need international and transnational coordination. This is a police organization. It's put together from three nations in the northern triangle of Central America. It doesn't look like what most people think of police. It looks like a looks almost like an IDF configuration. But you know, so sometimes these things blend. 
Um, you need, in some of the nations we go to, the police are split between preventive and investigative organizations. So when you talk to cops and liaison, you need to figure out which one of those they are. Community policing is ubiquitous. Some of these things require stability of policing or expeditionary policing to do the peacekeeping, the infra conflict, what I call full spectrum policing, which is going from walking the beat, talking to people, being able to then kid up to do counter riot, and then if necessary, kid up to do counter terrorism, and then when really necessary to go up into the high end of, you know, of, of policing or insurgency operations. And that requires detailed planning, detailed command and control, a lot of accountability. And for the police side, that's all under civilian control. I mean, yes, I mean, the military is under civilian control ultimately. On the civilian side, it, it's closer. But what enables, again, all of that's intelligence. Um, just shameless plug for a couple books. Uh, looked at uh, drug cartels and how they enhance their weapons in Mexico. They love 50 caliber bar barrett guns. That's like the, the status symbol down there. And they, they do use them. They use caltrips, they use claymores, and they've been weaponizing their own improvised anti-vehicle mines. You know, so I mean, if they can do it, anybody can do it, right? Um, they've been doing their own drones. They've been weaponizing their own drones. The drone weaponization from non-state actors is, is, is really exponentially increasing over time. In that book, we go through the evolution of how the cartels did that. And right now, Ukraine is like the laboratory on how to really get that done, which means that every irregular military force from Hezbollah to the Wagner Group and everybody else is figuring out how to do that. Um, Urban ops is key to doing this. Um, I really think that formed military gendarmerie carabinieri capability, which is more than what MPs do, like MPs on steroids. Um, you know, the Marine Corps has their expeditionary law enforcement brigade. This is something that I think is something that's not in our force structure, it's not in the Australian force structure or the British force structure, but it's in some of our NATO partners' force structures could become important, it could become something we could leverage. Crowd control is gonna be there, conflict management will be there. Non-lethal weapons. Now you don't think of non-lethal weapons in large-scale combat operations, and the ICRC definitely doesn't want you to think about that. But there may be times, and I understand their argument, I'm not sure they're always right. There may be times where that could become important to you. Like if you don't, if people are protesting and doing large crowd control operations proximate to a combat operation, that may become a useful tool. So you just need to figure out, you need to figure out what the suitability of war fighters is for their different missions, what the suitability of other forces might be. Um, always plug your friends, uh, Jamie Medby and Russ Glund. They, they wrote it in 2002. That's still current, that's still state of the art. Not much has changed. Um, not all of it has been you know, pulled into um, doctrine. You look at intelligence place, urban operations, a nice piece came out not too long ago. Um, it's worth taking a look at. And then, plug myself again, I did a whole case study on how you do urban IPB or intelligence preparation for op operations, uh, documented 10 years of experience we had at the Sheriff's Department on how to do that. And that's available uh, online if, if you guys thought. To conclude, and this is something the whole course has been talking about, but I'm just gonna hammer it home. Terrain and population are decisive. They always have been, they always will be. Intelligence, especially ops intel fusion is, is critical. And uh, kind of think back to Tony Zinni and the Marine Corps and their understanding of how this would go, the three block war. High intensity conflict, peacekeeping, and humanitarian aid could be within three blocks of your operation, simultaneous with everything you have to do. And that's complicated, it's hard, but we don't get to choose our threat. We're gonna deal with multiple threats, they're gonna come, and we're gonna hopefully be nice and organized as opposed to not. And I think, think that's it. I thank everybody for